I feel like I should just go down to my office now. <laughs> um, I, I am on, right? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, well, so it's me again, um, but now for something completely different. Last week I talked about the Sacred Heart as a, as a method of prayer. Um, it was a little woo-woo. Today's going to be not woo-woo at all, going to be very down to earth, okay? So we're going to talk about the Black Death, um, an event which took out between a third to half of the population of Europe in the space of just a few years. And I should note that it had similar mortality rates in, um, in, in, in Asia, in the Near East, and North Africa as well. I'm going to focus on Europe because one of the, partly because that's the one that's got, had the most scholarship because we are a Eurocentric culture, but also um, because I, I want us at the end of this to talk about the effects of the current pandemic on the church. So I want to look at you know, a, a context of another pandemic and its effect on the church. Um, I'm a comparativist by training, a comparative sociologist. So I like to think about how we can learn by comparing cases across time and space, what, you know, what that can teach us. So, um, so that's part of the reason we're doing this. And partly because it's just fascinating. It's just really, really interesting subject. I've, I've been fascinated with the Black Death for a long time. Um, you know, it's like a, a demographic catastrophe on this uh, order of magnitude cannot not change the society where it takes place. And our pandemic is also changing and will change us. And I think it'll be interesting to think about what those changes might look like. So we'll talk about that some in the end. I'll talk a lot at the beginning, just give you some information about the Black Death. And then, and, and then in the end, we'll, we'll discuss what, what might be changing for us now. Now, there's two uh, resources that I highly recommend to you, um, one of which is Dorsey Armstrong's course on, uh, from the teaching company or, or the great courses, it seems to go by both names, on the Black Death. And she's, she's amazing. It's so interesting. And I would completely recommend this to you. And I would also recommend to you anything that she talks about on any subject at all. She's just that good. And then there's another thing I'd recommend, The Great Mortality, which is a book by John Kelly. And um, it's, it's actually funny, okay? In a way that you can only be about a tragedy like many centuries later, okay? Like you couldn't be funny about the AIDS pandemic or, you know, COVID. I guess some of the late night TV people have to be funny about it. But, you know, like while people are actually dying or, or still basically warm, you can't make jokes about it. But, you know, but he, the way he just presents it, it's a, it's a very lively and, and, and good read. And so um, I would recommend that to you as well. So let's start out with a little um, thought experiment, a little bit of an exercise of imagination. Imagine that we are us here now going through COVID, but with no medicine, no medical science, nothing. Okay. So, um, you know, the one thing we might be wondering is, well, what is it? What, you know, what is this thing that's happening to us? Is it a, a judgment from God? Is it... Uh, a lot of people wondered that during the Black Death. Probably a lot of people are wondering that now. But anyway, uh, is it a judgment from God? Is it a, is it, is it a, a weather phenomenon? Is it, um, you know, they speculated about various things that were going on that were kind of unusual in the weather. And then um, some people wondered if it was uh, uh, some kind of weird alignment of planets and stars and stuff. You know, was it an astrological phenomenon? I mean, they had no idea what it was. And without medical science, we wouldn't either, right? So what is it? Where does it come from? They didn't have any germ theory. They didn't understand. They didn't know about microorganisms, right? So where, where does it come from? What's causing it? Um, and of course, then when you don't know what's causing it or where it comes from, you don't know how it's transmitted. You don't know how to protect yourself. Like, like we know that, I'm taking the mindset of the medievals here, we know that getting close to people who are infected is a bad idea, okay? But we don't know why. We don't know what the mechanisms of transmission are. Um, and um, so we, don't, we certainly don't know how to treat it. Uh, and we also don't know how long it will last and how it will end. I think we can relate to that, right? Um, also, we don't have any healthcare workers to burn out. No scenes like this one where there's a lot of science happening, right? Uh, we don't have any healthcare workers to burn out. Who's going to take care of us? How, how, is, how are they going to take care of us? What are they going to do for us? Okay. And most of all, you know, we have no hope because we have no science. 
And if you think back to the beginning of this pandemic, um, and even back like to the beginning of the HIV AIDS pandemic, we didn't, we didn't really know what it was. And so we didn't know how, you know, how it was, how it was happening, how it was transmitted, and all that kind of like how to protect ourselves. But we knew there was science and we knew the science would get on top of it eventually. It might take a long time, but it would eventually help us, okay? None of, the, none of that did they have in those days, okay? So uh, Europe before the Black Death struck was, was actually doing rather well. So there, there had been a weather phenomenon called the little climatic optimum, and it was essentially a warming period. And so what happened was the warmer temperatures made for longer growing seasons and there was lots of food. And so what happens when there's lots of food? Well, the population increases, right? So the, um, the population uh, went from, let me see where it says, uh, between the years 1000 and 1300, the population of Europe doubled from uh, 38.5 million to 75 million. Great, except that that puts pressure on the land and eventually you don't really have enough food left. And so um, what people did was they started moving into the cities because what's going on at the same time is, you know, think about old um, feudalism, okay? And I know a lot of historians don't like that word feudalism, but we're gonna use it for convenience. So uh, a feudalistic system you have, uh, wealthy landowners, right? The, the, the nobility, the people who own the land, uh, that's about 5% of the population. Then you have the, the church, you have the, the you know, higher clerics, um, about 5% of the population too. 90% of the population is going to be worker bees, either peasants or serfs. Serfs, unlike slaves, don't follow their masters around, they stay on the land. So if a land changes hands, the serfs stay on that land, okay? So, so, but they are forced laborers. And so that's, you know, that, that's who was doing the work during the feudal era. But by the time the plague hits, we've already seen the rise of a merchant class in Europe. There's a lot of trading going on. And so you have people like, like the father of Francis of Assisi, who was a cloth merchant. And he would go and trade, you know, and come and sell the stuff in his shop in Assisi, right? And this is happening more and more. And so people are urbanizing because they're giving up on sustaining, you know, their, their livelihood in the country and moving to the cities where they might be able to find jobs. It's exactly the same phenomenon that's happening today, especially in the global South, which is why we're getting these monster sized cities like Lagos, you know, and, and places like that because people cannot sustain their way of life that they've had for generations in, you know, the places where they've traditionally lived. And so it's, it's the same process uh, in a lot of ways, at least. So you have urbanization going on. So people are on the move. They're traveling for trade. They're also going on pilgrimage and they're also going to war. Okay. So people are moving around and that's going to be important to the story. All right. So enter the plague in 1346. So it came from Central Asia where they had rodent populations that would periodically die off, okay? And, and one of the things that local people know, and they know this in places like, um, like Oklahoma, for instance, like if you have a, 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 a prairie dog die off, they'll cordon off the area and, and tourists are not supposed to go in. And so it was the same thing there where, the, where plague was endemic, local people knew when it was dangerous to go into certain areas but people were on the move. And so all these merchants and people were coming from long distances with them. I mean, they didn't know any of this stuff. So, so they went you know, to these areas and, um, and, and could get infected. But the story that's told the most, plague probably entered Europe in lots of ways, but the story that gets told the most, and I think is really fascinating, is the story of the siege of Kaffa. So essentially what happened was there's a, there's a city, actually I moved to the next slide and you'll be able to see it. Um, this is Kaffa right here. So there's a trade route, it's on the Black Sea. So there's a trade route and Kaffa is an important, you know, sort of strategic point along that route. And, um, and so what happened was you had traders, especially the Genoese, um, also the, some of the Venetians, they were, they were great long distance traders. And they, they went to these places, they were going into Asia, buying stuff, bringing it back, making fistfuls of money off of this. And, um, 
and but they didn't get along so well with the with the Mongol population, the um, the Muslims, and so conflict happened, and the Mongols laid siege to Kaffa, and so it went on for a couple of years. The, the Europeans who held Kaffa, fortunately for them, they were on the water, okay? So they could always get supplies in. So the siege wasn't terribly successful. And eventually the Mongols realized that, you know, they probably weren't gonna win this one. But by the time they did realize that, they were starting to get sick, okay? They were starting to get the plague and, and they were getting sick and dying. And so the siege wasn't gonna last much longer, but, with, but they figured that, in a, in a sort of fit of spite, apparently, because they didn't understand germs either. Uh, so they weren't trying to infect the Christians, but apparently in a fit of pique, they just, they put their, their dead on catapults and just poof, over the walls. Yes, first known case of germ warfare. <laughs> so as I say, they didn't know that they would be infecting people, but they thought the stench at least would be very demoralizing. And so that was, you know, so they just, and, and then of course it did infect the people inside. So what did they do? They get, you know, pretty demoralized. They're starting to fall ill. So they get on their ships and they, they head back to Europe. So what happens is they, um, they go back and um, to get back to Genoa, they have to pass through this strait um, between the, the toe of the boot of Italy and, and this is Sicily and Messina is the port city, okay? So they land at Messina. By this time, a lot of their shipmates are dead, okay? And the rest are not doing so well, mostly. And so they, they dock at Messina and the, the people of Messina realize this is not a good thing, you know? But by the time they realized they really shouldn't be letting these people ashore, the rats have all jumped off and are going to look for new, you know, new uh, hosts. And so it's too late. It's way too late. And similar things are happening in Pisa, which is the main port for Tuscany, uh, Genoa itself, Marseille, Toulouse, places like that. Um, what's this island right here? Mallorca, uh, places like that. I mean, they're all it would eventually get people who would come in, who would um, start the infection, you know, at the docks. And then when people, you know, the citizens of these places realized that there was a terrible illness that was, that was moving toward them, they would um, hightail it to inland and, in order to try to escape it and basically just take it with them. Okay, so that's how it spread and it eventually just fanned out all across Europe um, and ended up kind of in the in Scandinavia and um, you know, kind of the um, Eastern Europe, so that it actually kind of drew a noose in a few years around Europe and just pulled it tight. Okay, so uh, look at the death tolls. So as I say, it began in Central Asia, but in two to three years, it killed roughly a third to a half of the population of Europe. So Europe before the plague had doubled its population, remember, to about 75 million. They lost at least 25 million, possibly more than that. If the US were to take a hit like that today, these are the numbers we'd be looking at, 110 to 167 million dead in the space of a couple of years. Globally, that would mean 2.6 to 4 billion people. Yeah, so that's like, fortunately, we have not, we have not had mortality rates of that kind. But remember, medicine, right? Uh, and so, um, but, the, but you can't take a hit like that. Like, it, it, it took such a giant demographic bite out of these societies that it couldn't possibly be left unchanged. So let's look at the disease itself. The, the Black Death and there's some controversy about this. Some people have suggested that maybe the Black Death wasn't, wasn't the plague. Maybe it was, um, maybe it was something like a, a, really, a really rabid, really um, virulent strain of tuberculosis, or it was smallpox or something like that. But most people think it was probably bubonic plague. Um, and um, so uh, it arrived, in, as I say, in Sicily, 1347, peaked in 1348 and was petering out around 1350, but it kept coming back about every 10 years or so. So it took until 1500 for the population of Europe to rebound all the way. It's a long time. One of, the th one of the reasons for that is that when it would come back, it would strike especially hard on, on, on children. And so, you know, you have a bunch of children, 
but then you lose, you know, half of them to plague, you know, then you, you don't get to make a whole lot of progress. So, um, but most scholars believe it was actually um, uh, bubonic plague. So, um, uh, Yersinia pestis is the, is the organism responsible, and um, it lives in fleas. It likes to live, um, it likes to travel on rodents doesn't really love humans, but it'll, it'll hitch a ride on us if necessary, if there's like nothing else going. Uh, but likes to live on, you know, rats, um, marmots, prairie dogs, as I said, uh, all, all kinds of things like that. And, um, and there's three main forms of it. So I just wanna go through these real quickly. So bubonic plague, you're basically bubonic plague, okay? Um, but from the time that you get bitten and infected, oh, I didn't, I didn't tell you how the actual infection happens. Uh, this is important because it's really gory. Okay, so, so when the, so fleas when they when they are on a uh, rodent host, they bite it and they and they take in the bacilli, you know, from that host. But the thing is that they 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 gather them in their digestive tract because they can't really digest them all the way, and so they get hungrier and hungrier while these things are kind of wadding up within their their stomachs. And you know they so they bite more and more aggressively because they're really hungry. And so what eventually happens is that when they bite, they regurgitate the bacilli into their host, and that's how they pass it on. Okay, so if that's you, um, you're out of luck, basically. <laughs> so okay, so basic bubonic plague. It takes from that initial wound um, it takes about two to six days to start showing symptoms. All right, uh, and the symptoms are really they're really vague. So headache, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, fever, joint pain, rashes, and just generally feeling like crap. Okay. Um, but there's one thing that does really distinguish bubonic plague, and that's the thing for which it gets its name, which is buboes. And buboes, um, let me just show you a couple of examples. If you want to do a Google image search on buboes, I hope you have a strong stomach. Okay. Let's, let's not linger there. <laughs> um, but, but buboes are swollen lymph glands. Okay. They're sw swollen uh, lymph nodes. And so if you've ever had a swollen node, you know that this is a painful thing, but I mean, uh, it can be, it, it got really painful because what would happen is um, they would fill up with pus and blood and just become excruciatingly tender. And so people would walk around, like if they had a bubo on their neck, sorry, I'm having a little trouble with this right now. Um, if they had a bubo on their neck, they would walk around kind of tilted like this, like a characteristic tilt, you know, so that they wouldn't put pressure on it. And then I assume they would do the same thing, like, you know, with a, un, under their armpit or in the groin, because that is where you get, you know, um, get the bubo. So it depend where you got them depended on where you got bitten. Okay, so you get bit on the ankle, you're going to have a bubo in the groin, on the hand, it's going to be in the armpit, you get bitten on the head, it's going to be on the neck. Okay. Um, and they smell terrible because of tissue necrosis, tissue death. Um, and, um, and, and what doctors would do sometimes, and you can see the logic behind this, is they'd figure, well, let's just lance this thing, you know, because it hurts a lot. So let's just, you know, and um, basically what they succeeded in doing was just spreading it all over everybody present and not really doing anything for the disease. Um, so without treatment, the mortality rate was about 85%. So you had a 15% chance of getting through this alive. Interesting, I, I don't have a lot of information on this, but I've heard that there were people who were resistant to the plague in the 14th century and that they've somehow figured out by making some kind of DNA connections that, that their, um, their descendants um, tend to be resistant to HIV. So it's like, that is very weird. And, and it, it would make a fascinating, fascinating mystery. Uh, I mean, it is a fascinating mystery. Um, okay, so Bubo, sorry, you had to see that one more time. Um, but there's another form of pneumonic plague. And um, this is when the plague gets to the respiratory system. And, and you can get this two ways. Either it can just wander to it from wherever it was before, from the lymphatic system um, to the lungs, or it can be spread by droplet infection, you know, human to human. And as we know, that makes that for a whole different game, right? Because then it's very, very um, transmittable, very, um, very easily. Incubation is shorter, one to two days. 
And you had all the same, you know, symptoms, kind of vague stuff that's sort of flu-like, but the, the characteristic here is not buboes, but coughing up blood, shortness of breath, chest pain. I mean, basically anytime you're coughing up blood, it's not a good thing, okay? So like, don't ignore it, go to the doctor. It's bad news to be coughing up blood. In this case, it was really bad news because mortality without treatment, 99%, okay? So some places had outbreaks specifically of pneumonic plague uh, and they had, you know, ungodly losses of population, just terrible, terrible. Um, this picture on the right here is a plague doctor. And so plague doctors, it, it was like the medieval hazmat suit, okay? So what they did was they, they really didn't know what they were doing, but they happened upon something that actually did offer some protection. So the idea here was they would have this mask and they put like, like herbs or, or flowers in it to, to just, just try to deal with the smell of their patients. But of course, having that between, you know, having a mask, right? It, it does help. And then they put on these robes and all this. Oh dear, Amanda, please help me. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, so, um, so just having like that, they, they put on these um, like leather uh, garments so that like when they sprayed, you know, the contents of a boobo all over themselves, you know, they could take it off later. Yeah. Oh, like, you know, without antibiotics, which were hundreds of years off. Yeah. So basically mortality rate in the, during the Black Death was 99%. Yeah. 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 No, they, yeah. Antibiotics wouldn't come along till the 20th century. So um, yeah, don't, don't ignore coughing up blood. Bad idea. All right, so the, the, uh, the last one is septicemic plague. Now, septicemia basically is bad news no matter what causes it, right? Like you have whatever it is, is made it into your bloodstream, is releasing toxins all throughout your body, which is why your organs begin to fail. Um, and it's really bad news. And you can see here somebody who's like lost circulation in their, in their fingers. Um, one of the things that can happen is something called disseminated intravascular coagulation. This comes up all the time on house. You know, like when they're trying to, to guess what the person, well, maybe it's DIC, it's never DIC. But anyway, DIC is interesting because what happens as I understand it is that you have all these small clots being formed throughout the body. And then um, because the clotting factor gets used up, the person would just bleed, you know, just bleed to death. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's a bad thing. 100% fatal without treatment. Um, even with treatment, a lot of people die, okay? Because uh, a lot of people die of all sorts of septicemia. It's just, it's, a, it's an emergency and it's often a disaster. My dad had septicemia and he made it despite being um, allergic to like antibiotics. <laughs> so um, yeah, that was kind of miraculous. Anyway, um, so when you think about the things that... Um, sorry, let me catch up to myself. Uh, that caused such terrible mortality rates. A lot of it had to do with just the state of things in Europe at that time. Susan. So I'm going to add one thing. I, I read a long time ago that somebody thought was this a more virulent form than we currently have in prairie dogs or like animals? Yes. What I actually so you said yes, but what I heard then was they found that mostly it was related to malnutrition. Yeah, mal malnutrition was a part of the story because remember the land crunch that happened? People weren't actually, people had been feeding well, but by the time the plague arrived, that was kind of right. dropping yeah. off. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so that did weaken people and make them more susceptible for, for sure. Um, however, the, the, the thing did seem to mutate. So when it came back, as I said, every 10 years or so, um, it was not as virulent as, as it had been during the initial yeah. wave, which actually was not, I mean, it's the second pandemic. There was another pandemic of plague earlier, the plague of Justinian, and then there's been a third one, but we don't need to go into all that. Um, they didn't have any public health systems. Actually, the, 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 um, the leaders of Venice did um, form what was one of the first public health systems 
in that they got together and said, what, what are we going to do? You know, what can we, and one of the things that they did, and you may have heard this story by now, but uh, they, they thought, well, well, let's not let ships dock until they've been out there for a while and we can be sure that the people on board are not in infected. And so we, they thought, well, how long should we give them? How about 40 days? How about una quarantina? Okay, so that, and that's where we get the, the term quarantine from, but they didn't have any public health for the most part. Um, waste disposal, you know, you probably can't see this woodcut very well, but it's somebody emptying a chamber pot in the street, which was the usual practice, right? And so, you know, the streets were full of animal waste, human waste, you know, the costume dramas never really give us the real picture, right? Um, so they didn't have, you know, they didn't bathe that much. And sometimes, in fact, they were told not to bathe because it was believed by many that like getting undressed and, and, and getting water on you opened your pores to all kinds of bad things that could enter in. So stay out of that bathtub if you want to stay healthy. Um, and, you know, their housing, I mean, like, it was, it was, there were lots of openings for rats to get into. And if you think about thatched roofs, for instance, I mean, there's a reason why they invented canopy beds, because there's all kinds of stuff running around in there. And, you know, it could fall on you while you slept. And, you know, nobody wants to wake up with a rat on their face, right? So, and also the floors, the floors of the wealthy would be maybe stone or some kind of tile or something. But, but most people lived on floors of beaten earth, which would be covered with rushes you know, just dried vegetation. And in that could be, you know, food, bits of beer, insects, another vermin, you know, people vomited or whatever, you know, like it, 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 was, it, was, not, it was not nice and it wasn't changed all that often. Um, I just want like, do I have to, oh yeah, I have time. Um, Kelly, John Kelly, who wrote the, 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 great, um, the great Mortality, he wrote an account of the murder of Thomas Beckett who was the Archbishop of Canterbury who had the dispute with Henry II. And Henry said, you know, well, no one rid me of this meddlesome priest, you know, and his knights thought that was an order. So they go in while he's celebrating, you know, it's, it's Vespers or something, and they cut off the top of his head, which, you know, he didn't survive. Uh, and um, anyway, here is, is what Kelly, how Kelly described the aftermath of this. The Archbishop was murdered in Canterbury Cathedral on the evening of the 29th of December. The body lay in the cathedral all night and was prepared for burial on the following day. He had on, now get this list, he had on a large brown mantle, under it a white surplice, below that a lamb's wool coat, I mean it is December, right? So um, a lamb's wool coat, then another woolen coat, and a third woolen coat below this. Under this, there was the black cowled robe of the Benedictine order. Under this, a shirt, and next to the body, a curious hair cloth covered with linen. Now the hair cloth, of course, the hair shirt was worn for penitential reasons. And I've heard it described as kind of like a shirt made out of um, steel wool, okay? Um, all right, so he's got all of this stuff on and it goes on to say, as the body grew cold, the vermin that were living in this multiple covering started to crawl out because it's no longer warm and cozy, right? <laughs> Stay with me. And according to the chronicler, quote, the vermin boiled over like water in a simmering cauldron and the onlooker, onlookers burst into alternate weeping and laughter. <laughs> Kelly's a hoot. I know. <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, it was, it was all pretty gross, frankly. Uh, medieval medicine was primitive in Christian Europe, better in the Islamic world, better in those parts of Europe that abutted onto the Islamic world, places like Spain, for instance. Southern Italy had, um, in Salerno, had an, an eye clinic, a center of eye care, because they learned, they learned everything they knew from the Muslims. And so um, what did the Christians have? They had astrology. They had Galen's theory of the four humors. Um, they, had, they could amputate limbs. They could cauterize wounds, uh, which was a procedure that St. Francis went through. Uh, they could examine urine. Now, examining urine can tell you some things, right? If, if, there's, if it's cloudy, there's probably an infection. If there's blood in it, something bad is going on. <laughs> you know, if it's too dark, you know, the person's probably dehydrated. But it can tell you if you have a brain tumor, right? It can tell you if you have the plague. Right, so, um, so they'd examine urine. Uh, they had all kinds of herbal remedies for various things. Um, 
But one theory that they had was um, the idea of a miasma or miasma, which is a giant toxic cloud that just creates disease. All right, so back to that in just a sec. Um, what kinds of treatment did they have? Well, I've already mentioned a couple, but they also did bloodletting. Uh, and, um, you know, bloodletting is also good for certain things like hemochromatosis, another one that comes up on house a lot, but it, it never actually is hemochromatosis. Um, but they always guess that. Uh, and, and on the theory of miasma, um, one of the treatments was the, the idea was you could drive out foul air by introducing even fouler air. So what people would do is they would go out to the public latrines and sort of crouch down and you know, you know, take it in, you know, and I, I, you know, right, that didn't help. Um, they were told to avoid accidents of the soul. They were told to avoid basically stress, okay? So like um, accidents of the soul, overthinking things, getting angry, you know, getting upset. And we know how easy that is to avoid during a pandemic, right? <laughs> Don't get upset, stay mellow. Um, the church told them to fast and pray, which also did not particularly help. I mean, it may have helped them individually, but it didn't stop the plague. Uh, and if all else fails, you can always find somebody to blame. So they blame the Jews. And in fact, you know, anti-Semitism goes way back in Europe. Long, I mean, it was a tradition long before the Holocaust. And so they would round them up and put them in houses and just burn it down. You know, like, they, I mean, there were all these rumors about Jews poisoning the wells of Christian communities and all this stuff. And so scapegoating is something that we still see, don't we, when we are threatened with a pandemic. And so uh, that has definitely not changed. Um, so they had no idea what to do. They had no idea. So they turned to God, they turned to the church um, and it didn't help. And that had certain consequences for the church, which I'll come to in just a minute. Uh, I'm going to go over the, um, the labor shortage very quickly because I really want to talk about, I, I want us to talk about changes on, on, on the church, for the church. But they had, um, I mean, they had a serious labor shortage. I mean, they just lost so many live, you know, living, breathing people that there was nobody to get the work done. And so um, what that meant was that workers had power that they hadn't had before. Imagine that you're a serf, you hate your master. I mean, why wouldn't you, right? And so, you know, enter the plague, all these people are dead, you made it through. And so you can go anywhere you want. You know, you were, you were formerly tied to the land, right? But now you can go anywhere you want and name your price because the landlord down the way is not going to turn you back like he might've done earlier to, to where you legally belong. Instead, he's gonna say, you know what, we're, we're just work for me. I really need bodies here, you know? And so, so you could go anywhere you wanted. You could do anything you wanted. You could name your price. And so that gave them power that they hadn't had before. And it really changed things. And so um, one thing that I was gonna bring up if we, if we had time, which I don't think we do, is during the present pandemic, we're seeing something similar in the great resignation where people are really having a hard time finding employees because, you know, there just aren't enough people working. And so, um, um, so it was a similar thing, maybe happening for somewhat different reasons, but, um, okay. Um, but, um, but a similar, a similar lack of, of labor, which gave them more power vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the nobility. So um, let's just get to the consequences for the church, because this is something I really want to talk about. Um, the church really lost prestige and authority because they didn't have any advice to give that was of any use for the plague victims. Um, and some priests really carried out their pastoral ministry, you know, very heroically, very bravely, but lots didn't. A bunch of them just fled. And of course that didn't necessarily help keep them alive, but it, um, but it did cause people to be very disappointed in them. And, um, there was a shortage of priests to attend people who were dying to give them last rites. I mean, there's also like a shortage of ground, consecrated ground to bury them in and all that kind of stuff. But, but to, to die without making your confession and receiving last rites and then be tossed into a hole namelessly, I mean, like that really freaked the medieval mind out. And so one of the things that, that the church actually told people was, 
If you're dying, make your confession to anyone you can, even a woman, <laughs> even a woman, imagine that. But seriously, so what happens is that lay people start doing things that they had not done before. It had all been pray, you know, pay, pray, pay and obey. And now people were kind of going, you know what? They don't have all the answers. They don't seem to have any answers, frankly, and they can't even take care of us. Maybe we can get some answers and maybe we can take care of ourselves or each other. And it may be a little bit of a stretch, but a lot of people think that that kind of questioning of clerical authority paved the way for the Protestant Reformation a couple centuries later, because here's the thing. It's like a really long step from the unthinkable to the thinkable. The step from the thinkable to the possible is a little shorter, probable gets shorter still, likely, inevitable. It's a sequence of decreasingly long steps, you know? And so once you start realizing that I can ask questions, Basically, it's all over, right? So, um, so you know, that's something something to think about. They did replace the priests that had been lost, but they replaced them with people who were not from the elite. I mean, the, the, most of the priests were like the younger sons of you know wealthy families, and um, and they replaced them with people who couldn't even read, who had no training, and they rose through the ranks, and you know that further decreased the authority and prestige of the church. And so. Um, so my question to you is, how is COVID changing the church today? Like, what kinds of changes do you see? What kinds of changes do you think we might be in for? And how, how can we respond to them? What do you think? Susan? As far as kind of the denominational level or something like that, I, I don't have a thought about it or put it together, but what I have seen is that um, churches who have financial and techn technological resources, so mm -hmm. even church that has a lot of money, but mm -hmm. on top of it before, or vice versa, um, now can try to have that. So I'm, I occasionally meet other churches online, or not, and found that the ones that are older, who have an older and shrinking congregation, um, I think their demise is going to be sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of deep change in the denomination. Yes. And, and that, come, that comes with uh, abandoning church property that now belongs to a diocese that can or cannot afford to keep that land. And, right. You know, it, it, the, the, I see part of economic repercussions more so even than spiritual ones, mm -hmm. but it also means that there are not going to be any church that does come up is going to be, um, I think people will be returning to in-person churches because that's important, mm -hmm. but it'll probably be a lot of smaller and newer ones, young, uh, younger, not, but even more so I've seen the rise of non-main, not even churches, just spiritual activity that people call spiritual, whether they are or not. Mm -hmm. Some very much are, but they may not be as Christianity. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, um, so it's sort of there's this groundswell of one being coming, mm -hmm. but it's there, sort of like the mosque that magically talks about that too, but it's coming here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, I said So let me ask you this, 
do you think that people really do, I mean, obviously some of us do, but do you think people sort of more generally do want to gather together in person? Yes, yes, yes. Why the majority? I'm, I'm sorry? Why would we be here? Well, we do, but we might not be representative of the larger church. Yes. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not, not going to accept that this can build off of this. I think when, when the pandemic first hit, I was teaching, you know, some spiritual community. Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. They had a really great weekly presence. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I felt connected with the people, you know, who were, you know, singing or gospel. They were deeper in the audience. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it was, I was like, I'm sitting here in Seattle and I'm connecting with a very young, non denominational, like, I've never attended, mm -hmm. you know, a church non denominational, but I felt like. Relevant to me. Mm -hmm. So I do think that you have this geographical spread that is diminished with online presence, mm -hmm. and it is primarily younger congregations that have mm -hmm. the ability to um, to create an experience online that isn't just simulcasting a, a uh, you know a, a service, which I think mm -hmm. is very dry and not engaging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I definitely think that there are winners and losers, um, and I think it is led by the ability to um, to have an engagement online presence. Mm -hmm. So do you think that that in, a, in you talked about community? So do you think that com that real community can be built that way, or that it's just a fleeting kind of individualistic experience? No, I think I, I do think real community can be built that way, and I think it's like. Like, I think of it as, like, maybe more informal ways. Like, I feel like service, when you come, it's like you attend, and it's for this time to this time. Like, mm -hmm. like you know, a lot of the cool things we, um, it, 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 like, an example is, like, almost like talk radio, where you can kind of call in and ask questions, and it's, like, live, and it just feels more engaging, mm -hmm. and there's a chat going, and things mm -hmm. like that. Like, mm -hmm. that is more um, engaging and community building than, like, watching Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the digitization of church is a very strange nuance? And I guess I don't agree. I don't think the whole point of church is meant to be there in person. And that's always the most part is how important it is. It's a commandment. Mm -hmm. You know, you go on the church, you know, you travel to mm -hmm. see the whole United church. And then all of a sudden, the church is like, oh, this doesn't really matter anymore. You know, you can do this online. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it's an individualistic, a fleeting individualistic experience. You know, I can't wait. I can't wrap my mind around it. It, doesn't, it seems opposite to what we're meant to be doing. And in a way, it's the church is doing this to try to fill in the life. My husband, the agnostic, quoted to me the verse today that says, forsake not the gathering of yourselves together. And I was like, you did pay attention in Sunday school many years ago, you know? Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, I agree. I'm also 60 years old uh, and know the benefits of that. But um, I also teach. Uh, so one of my hobbies and interests has been sewing, and so I have Instagram accounts that follow me and sew and uh, follow blogs. And I'm not that active, um, but I have seen people of all ages, but especially younger people, mm -hmm. people who are technologically savvy, who oh they have start to have conversations with individuals mm -hmm. who have these accounts. Mm -hmm. And then there's there's a Facebook group and uh, there's a formal sewing community called uh, there is a sewing village sewing village etc. So it's formal and then there's some informal communities on Facebook and people get together to meet in person eventually but they build these little piecemeal connections in the same kind of way mm -hmm. that you would talking to somebody at the coffee yard mm -hmm. 
I don't know. I like to collecting with people in person to try to gain a mental relationship. I know a little bit about mm -hmm. but um, I think that the other point during which people in the technology phase have center in the conversation and experience or experience in life. You know, so you've got there's two key variables in what you've said. You've talked about generation and you've talked about introvert, extrovert. And so, like, I'm an introvert too, believe it or not. Hey. Um, but, but you know, I have several, several of my closest friends are people that I seldom, if ever, see face to face. One of one very close friend I've had for over ten years, I have never met in person. And so, um, so there, there are people who are fine with that. And I think it. I mean, even though I'm kind of old. Um, I think younger people are more and more are more comfortable with that still, and so that made that's probably a consideration. Yeah, that. So my, uh, that's a little bit of my mother was like thirteen, and the uh, NATO allies um, put together pen pals. Oh yeah, yeah, I, yeah. So my mom started writing to several people, including Burley, England. Mm -hmm. And my mom's now dad, my dad called this girl and you know, <laughs> you know I have some of this. That that was a virtual connection in 1945 and 1975 when we visited England. But it was a real connection. It was my mom described her as one of the best. Yeah, yeah. Having never even met. I mean, one of the things that you can do when you when you communicate like that is you can sort of get past all the small talk and the exactly. timidity and like all that kind of stuff and just go into something yeah. deeper. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is that it's I think our future is gotta be hybrid. Mm -hmm. It's going to, you know, digital natives are gonna to come forth to find teachers in their line and find communities online and learning online. And then there's others of us who are going to love the in-person connection. And I, I know that for me, I've been uh, participating in church in a hybrid of the two. Mm -hmm. If I'm out of town, I watch online. If I'm here, yeah. I come. And so it's, um, you know, it's been we did sacred ground on Zoom, but now we're mm -hmm. in person. Mm -hmm. You know, so there's just like a hybrid grab, and I, I think that's got to be the future to continue to build a community. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I saw one more hand up here. No, I'm just thinking that um, I know with my, my old brother and his wife, their family was very protective of them. And so they did have they had one another. Mm -hmm. So they have conversation and all that kind of thing where they, you know, telephone and and Zoom mm -hmm. um, has really kept people connected. But they were very protected. Um, mm -hmm. and everybody had their vaccinations and all that kind of thing. Um I found that I it was important for me to meet with my friends to go walking. We kept our distance, mm -hmm. we wore our masks, we were very loud in order to cheer one right. another. <laughs> and, uh, but it was but it was important that we get that exercise and that we and we have those connections. And I have kept those connections. Mm -hmm. And it's been very important to me. But I have to say there's an energy when you're doing Mm -hmm. And that's a very uplifting kind of thing. Yeah. And when I came back to church, I just noticed it. I mean, I missed it when we did, when we did online. As, as wonderful as it was to see people, and you could really see people in the congregation, so you still felt a bit of a connection. Mm -hmm. that energy. Yeah. I was just reading something that made a distinction between connecting and gathering and what the what the the person was arguing was that churches are not a lot of churches are not going to survive unless they learn how to connect with people who aren't willing or able to gather i i know that doy is really he's got the vision to see that in the future there's going to be a parish beyond the parish that in fact we're building now um and um but i know he also really really wants to see us gather you know so both of those things are happening so so i guess the thing i would leave you with since we're basically out of time is um is that we need we need to understand that society is changing this is bigger than us people aren't as willing to join things as they used to be remember bowling alone 
you know, people aren't as willing, especially younger people, to join things and especially to see their future as being in institutions, especially the church. Um, you know, so there may be that reluctance there. So we may still, we need to figure out how to connect to those people while we strengthen the things that remain, you know, and gather the people who are here, you know, so, so we're going to have to find our way through that challenge and, um, well, it's an interesting time, isn't it? Thanks for coming. This is fun. And thanks for your thoughts. And also, if you, if anything else on their insights occur to you, please tell them to me because I'm, I'm longing to sort of think this through.